moms, we have a little bit of time today. It's kind of a crazy week. You know, I don't know if you, most of you are probably celebrating spring break. Some of you have it next week, but you're probably already in that mode. So that's kind of nice to be in that little bit more relaxed space. So I figured we would just have a relaxed chat this morning and we may hit on all homeschool topics and that's okay because we have this opportunity to have Sarah here with us. And so I know you moms express interest in talking with her and asking questions, things like that. So now is your chance to do that. So I'll just turn that over to you. To you moms, sorry. Okay, I'll fire one off here. Um, I have a 10 year old and an eight year old. Okay, they weren't public school kids. Um, and I've pulled them out and with this being only our first year, I've been going through the whole well-educated heart and just trying to create a home of learning. And I'm just wondering what, what kind of gave you the passion to want to learn on your own, to be like an independent learner. I'm trying to set up like environments where my kids would want to learn, but my kids are still in that. I really hate school. <laughs> but I don't want to go back to public school because I like being in my pajamas all day. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think a big part of it, not the sole factor, but was um, having a generous amount of free time or say in what or, or details of what we were studying. Um, so having a little bit of, of opportunity to exercise some, I don't know, a little bit of control, some authority to, to pursue things I was interested in, um, rather than having it all scheduled out. Um, and then there were times when I just sat at the table and cried over math because we had to do math and not everything was going to be perfect and fun and sunshine all the time. Um, but I knew that if I did the math, there would be a time when it was, it was my choice to decide what I was going to do, what book I was going to read, how I was going to spend my time. Um, so having a generous, not too generous, but a generous, uh, chunk of time where I was, I felt like I was in control of what was, what was going on. Um, something else I thought of and then it just left um oh reading I reading books we just read a ton and <clears throat> the process of reading I really liked reading I know that not everybody does um but I really liked it and I really liked the way I felt at the end of every book where I felt like I had I knew something that I didn't know whether it was fiction or nonfiction. um so having it having a home that had a ton of books and then having taking regular trips to the library I felt like I couldn't get enough sometimes and just as years went on and I got older um the books changed the types of books changed and I was seeing like oh my gosh I really am learning a ton by reading and I like the way this feels and I like the way my mind feels you know open and um just full of stuff all the time. It was, it was a fun feeling to realize. Um, and I, I, I don't know. For, so, so I know it's different for everybody, but for me, it was reading and um, having a little bit of authority, a little bit of control, being taken seriously by my mom in um, expressing what I was interested in and her allowing me to govern um, chunks of my time. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if you can see Cassie's on here as well as Abby Haskell. I probably just butchered her last name. Sorry about that, Abby. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay, Amy, were you going to ask something? I was, yeah, I was going to ask. So on subjects, this is what I was trying to figure out on subjects like that I'm not very strong in. Um, did you just find tutors or like a neighbor, you know what I mean? That they could just come and help and, um, you know, to help you in that topic or subject or, you know, cause I, I, I just know there are things that I've just was not 
strong in at all and things that I was, but um, that I felt like I, I don't know, do you, do you find, do you do that or, or like, what do you, or do you find, I mean, there's some of us that maybe you'd be strong in all everything, which is great, <laughs> but I know like for me, I'm, I, I'm not in. Well, so Sarah doesn't have to say it. I wasn't strong in very many of those high school subjects. <laughs> so that wasn't even, she didn't have that for sure. But anyway, what were you going to say? Yeah, we didn't, we didn't bring in. Oh, no, there was, there was a point in time when we brought in um, a math teacher in our ward when my older brother was in higher math. And um yeah, I, it was just for a little tiny well, it bit. Was, it, and actually, it's kind of funny. We brought in a tutor because we got to a problem that we couldn't figure out. Because normally, um, I would just give them the book and then say, come to me if you have a problem. And we would try to work it out. I didn't know how to do it. But in the process of talking through it and the child explaining to me how it was supposed to be done, they learned it. I learned more than I knew before, you know. Um, and so we were doing that on a particular math problem in, I don't know, I think it was trigonometry or something, but, and we kept getting the problem wrong and we got the same answer every time, but it was wrong. And according to the book. And so we asked this teacher who teaches high school math, this friend of ours to come over and help us work through and learn how to do this right. Cause we were obviously doing something wrong. Turns out the book was wrong and we were right. <laughs> so, um, but we got that worked out and, and it was my child that worked through it, you know and was trying to kind of teaching me. I always said, if you can just stay a chapter ahead of your child you're fine. Well, then we, we quickly passed that point somewhere in middle school. And, um, and I just would give them the books that I thought would be helpful to them. I would put out a whole bunch of books and then say, what are you interested in? What would you like to do? Some of these you have to do for high school credit. That was with the first two. <clears throat> and then others, you can choose what you want to do. And then with the next two, I became much more relaxed. With my last one, I didn't do those science books or even the math books. We really didn't do any of that. Uh, as I mentioned before, I kept being prompted to just let him go and explore the things he was interested in. And I finally did that. And he spent all kinds of time on his own, taking online classes and pursuing things he was interested in and has done far more than I would ever have assigned him to do and spent none of the time, I kind of say, wasting it on these high school subjects that none of us remember. If they create a foundation for what comes later and you're going to pursue that in college, great. But if you're not gonna pursue that in college, spend the time doing things that you're interested in, pursuing things that you're passionate about, spending a lot of time reading good books and good material that that give you more of a foundation for going out in the world that's what i think and we spent more time on the humanities on music and art and um <clears throat> on plays and what am i trying to think of something else but anyway on, on those kinds of things then we did on um, those the other kind of school subjects yeah, so we didn't we didn't bring in tutors, um, but we just utilized mom and dad. We'd save things if if we couldn't figure it out with mom, we'd sit down with dad after dinner and finish up things that we were stuck on. Um, but for the most part, our books were pretty um, pretty good at walking you through step by step. And if you went back a chapter, you know, if you couldn't figure it on that chapter, you could kind of backtrack or you could skip forward and find you know like maybe in the next chapter. Um, they would teach the same principle, but apply it a different way or teach a different method. And then things would click and then you could go back to the other one and figure it out. So we just relied heavily on our books. And then like mom said, just working through it, trying to figure it out together, um, which worked fine. You know, it was just nice to have emotional support. <laughs> well, um, you know, while you're just totally frustrated with something. So yeah, we didn't need to. But that doesn't mean that, it, I don't know, it, that just is how it worked out for us. Did you read the comment that came by? Mm -hmm. Lindsay Watkins, would you read that comment? Oh, I, I was just it. typing out to everybody that, um, for those who are joining us, just that we, who we have the opportunity to speak with, and if they had any questions to ask Sarah, then they could. 
Perfect. Thanks so much, Lindsay. No worries. I guess for me, my fear is kind of just letting them go and pursue their own thing because you're like, eh. my kids are, again, they're still at that age where they'd rather just play. And I understand that play is a big thing. They, they learn all sorts of scenarios. And I mean, my daughter makes up, she doesn't make up plays, but she makes up all these scenarios when they're playing dolls that I would have not thought to put in her roadmap, you know, as far as the story that they had to figure out. But it does kind of make you feel a little hesitant going, I just let them play dolls and play this for like four hours. And I'm hoping, mm -hmm. I'm hoping they're learning what they need to learn. And I've got to get out of that public school mind frame because I'm a public school kid and they were for a while. So this is just, for me, it's a big brain block. Yeah. Well, that doesn't mean though that there's no place for structure either, you know? And, and especially, I mean, you can have the goal of, of wanting to transition to being okay with just letting them go, but um, I don't know, maybe, maybe you kind of go in phases to that. Maybe, maybe you kind of just work your way gradually to that um, so that everybody feels like, okay, we're doing this on purpose. We're not just being lazy. We're not just not doing school. Um, but it is, it is hard. And the, the thing is though, is, I mean, we, it's easy to sit here and talk about um, taking breaks and going on trips and doing this adventure and not really structuring too much. But the fact was that at the start of pretty much every school year, we started with structure. Mm -hmm. It just kind of dissipated <clears throat> slowly or not so slowly some years. Um, but we always tried to keep it, try to have, you know, a, okay, we're studying out of these books and you're going to do these things on this day for this amount of time, a minimum of this time. And so we did a whole bunch of that. Um, well, and we had a lot of structure in other parts of our life. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> yes, we did. Um, but we did have we did have some school structure. I don't know that it was always necessary, but I don't know if maybe I don't know what all your other discussions in past weeks are. But um, while there was a lot of free time, there also was a chunk of structure that we ended up kind of taking out later because it wasn't necessary. But I don't know. I think it's a common problem to feel like you need to have a game plan to feel like you're doing something. I think what I've learned too is that, um, like we've talked the past few weeks of just incorporating into our everyday. So I know, like for me, when I first started, the I would give the the girls would go grocery shopping with me, and I'd give them a, a shopping list with money, and they had to add it and make sure it was, you know, two plus three plus, you know what I mean, and just simple math things like that but real life real world you know and then they would come back to me and be like mom I don't think we need the Oreos this week um because that's like four dollars <laughs> so you know what I mean it it taught them little um I that's where I was going because in real worldness you know like math for me is not not the greatest that's why I was like did you guys do tutor you know because I struggle and struggle and struggle with math i'm i'm like elementary maybe little junior high and that's like i mean it just goes over my head um history i can do yeah i'm history all, all day long but um so that's where i was like i need them to see everyday stuff so i'm wondering like you know did did you guys incorporate that you know like like um like Linnell, you know, saying that she, you know, named the trees, gave him names, but I would think like within that too, you could, you know, say, oh, well, this is a blank tree or, you know, whatever it is. It's a Alberta peach tree or, you know, and even we're going to name it, you know, blah, blah, kind of thing. So, um, yeah, we did a lot of that. Um, we did a lot of, um, like anytime we were baking something, we were in charge of the measuring, which was a good way to practice um, fractions because we never made a batch of cookies just a single batch it was always like at least doubled um, the yeah there's a ton of math to do in real life and we did a lot of that because we were all involved in household running responsibilities there were lots of opportunities to talk about what was happening um, 
and uh, and to have those those real world kind of experiences and problem solving. Um, well, you had your own money and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. We when we were little, we had allowances. When we were a little bit older, we would work for neighbors and people. So yes, yeah, so we were in charge of managing our own money and and doing that kind of math as well. Can I add something in here? Yeah. If you can hear me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so my parents homeschooled all of us kids, or there's 11 of us, and we had, um, varying amounts of homeschooling, but for, well, most of us were at least through elementary school and in high school and middle school at different times, right? And one of my, um, my parents aren't brilliant and they don't have, you know, skills in necessarily any particular field. But one of my brothers is a doctor, one of them is an accountant, one of them is a, um, my, my sister's a midwife. Like they are all successful in their own fields but, and, and they went on to college and stuff like that and, and uh, were able to do great and do really well. And my parents didn't teach them any major science or anything like we did very minimal science. So, and, and I actually spoke to another mom who has, she has four kids and her two older ones are both scientists and she like was so stressed about all that kind of stuff and so she was worried about you know teaching them those things and she said we never really did much and and then she, her older two went on to be really um they're really they're both like a, a chemist and something else anyways very heavily science fields anyways and so then she had two more kids later on like 15 years later she had like some, two surprise kids and um she was like i'm not even going to stress about this because i know that my older kids did fine so i'm not going to worry about like trying to cram science or other things down their throat that i don't i don't even know so i think i think we worry way more than we need to because like like marlene says it's like about their heart when they're young and the science stuff if it's something that they love and they're interested you'll know and they will like they will be seeking it out and like you won't be able to stop them from wanting to learn it you know so just a thought. How did you keep your drive? My fear was kids turn out late. Like when I get like kind of Lindsay said, like, come on, let's, you know, getting them to do it. You know, my, my kids would rather binge watch five seasons of psych, you know, in a row. I mean, it's just like, how, how do you get them to find that drive and just to kind of keep going? Let's see. Yeah. We, um, definitely binge watch psych too. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> um, well, there were, there were rules. There were just household rules. It wasn't as much a matter of, oh, we're really good at keeping our school schedules. You know, we're just internally motivated people. We're not, um, at all really. <laughs> it was just, there were, there were rules. Um, there, we had very limited TV time. We knew that. Um, we knew that we would have to spend more of our time outside than we did on the TV. So you didn't want to spend a ton of time on the TV if you didn't want to be outside for eight hours in the day. Um, but so there were things that just kind of forced us to not crave the, the other, the time wasters kind of, which are super fun. Um, they just weren't allowed that. So that's a, that's what happened in our family. So you so say, yeah, so we didn't have a lot of TV time. That does not mean that, um, that we didn't watch it every once in a while. Um, in fact, I, I don't know if I mentioned this in the past, but um, <clears throat> when I was little, we, did, we really didn't watch much TV. And so anytime I went to my grandma's, I was watching TV. Mm-hmm. And my siblings were outside playing, but at grandma's house, I could watch TV. And so I watched a lot of TV. Um, so it doesn't mean that like, oh yeah, you know, we were the kind of children that just, you know, couldn't sit through a TV show. We'd rather be outside. We did love being outside. We also loved watching movies. Um, so I don't think, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything really, maybe there is, I don't know if anything wrong with us seeking entertainment, we all like that. It's just a matter of regulating. So it's a healthy amount of entertainment versus worthwhile time. So the parent should regulate that time. You yeah. Think? I, 
I don't know. I don't know. I just know that's what we did. And that's, that's mm -hmm. kind of how, how things worked for us. You know, you couldn't, um, you, we could have times of our day where, okay, you did your chapter in your math book and you had your chapter in your history book. Now pick something that you want to do for this chunk of time. You have some free time here and we'll come back and do something later. Free time does not include TV. You know, there are exclusions to our, our time. So go find something. You so find do. something to do, read a book, color, do an art project, go outside, um, get some toys out, play with your sister, but we're not watching a movie. You know, it's the middle of our day. We're coming back to some school in a little bit. This is our, this is our learning time. It's not our TV time. Um, I don't know if that answers that at all. How but. do you think, how do you, what do you think motivated you to be where you are now? Like the person who wants to learn more, who wants to keep taking classes or keep learn, you know, reading more or who wants to travel, who wants to go see these things that you've learned about? Like, what do you think planted that in your heart? Because books, do you think books? Was reading, um, yeah. Reading about all different kinds of places um and I was mainly fiction so um so it was all different time periods different places very descriptive about the surroundings and so places and history became very interesting um because I liked my escapes to book worlds um and you know the, I was thinking earlier when somebody was talking um we were talking about math and science and um, and while there are principles and things we learn in those books that are really, really good, I think, at least in my life, just reading anything was more helpful when it came to, to those subjects, especially the college level courses, um, because being a reader, um, I was more patient. I was willing to sit down and read the textbook um, read through the slides from my professors. Um, I was used to having to kind of piece things together in my mind, try to figure things, you know, when you're reading a story and you're trying to figure out how it goes, that's what we're all doing, right? We're, we're trying to predict the plot before we get to it, or at least a lot of people do. I know I do that a ton. Um, so when I was reading for school, I was already going, okay, well, if that's this, then this must be this. And I'm kind of jumping ahead to see like, oh, can I predict the end of this chapter before we get to it? Can I kind of figure out what's going on? Um, so whatever it is, you know, what, what reading does to our minds and our, it just seems like it's, it strengthens our ability to process, and digest information, you know, kind of internalize things. Um, and then, seems to keep our imaginations a little more alive, creativity, things like that. So we're projecting, we're problem solving, we're thinking a little outside the box as we're reading, um, coming to our own realizations about things. Um, so I found that in my classes, yeah, I had success in college because reading was something I was used to and I was good at. So it wasn't frustrating or daunting. It was very possible. Um, so I was able to, to take in information through the books. Um, and I was able to just, in the meantime, just kind of let my mind go as they're lecturing or something like that and start thinking about, well, if that means this, then this means this. Well, could this be that? And, you know, just kind of making this little map in my head of what was going on. So I felt like, yeah. So, so for me, it was, it was reading a ton. It was books that, that led to a lot of um, ease in adjusting to college and um, motivation for continued learning, you know, just kind of opened up the world a bit, made things seem more possible and more fun than day-to-day -day tasks ever could give me, so. I guess for me, it's um, my homeschool. My brain constantly goes to just thinking about how I'm supposed to be molding my little children, you know? And I mean, this is why we show up every Friday. We're here, we're trying to mold ourselves and create our own drive for this learning because it's, 
you can't give them from an empty well. So that's what we're all doing here. And I think, and I know I do this so much as I forget to give myself credit where I am working. You know, my days, hmm, my days don't always go magically well. And I do let Satan in and I let him make me think that I'm just this failure. But you know what? In this short amount of time, you know how much I've learned? <laughs> And it pushes me to want to learn more. I'm a big crybaby. If you haven't figured that out yet, <laughs> get to know me. Um, <laughs> um, so yesterday it was, we took our kids, we did their little math lesson in the morning and I don't teach math. We have a computer program that does that. And he's Australian. So my kids love listening to him and <laughs> it's, um, then we went to the Picasso exhibit, which is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Picasso is not really my cup of tea, but I didn't want them to miss out on that experience and knowing that they got to see that. And then we just, we got to walk up and down the main drag in Nashville because it was just down straight and we went to, you know, out for pizza and we then took them to a candy shop and they got to make their own candy. They got to help design it and everything. And we sat last night, my husband and I, and we said, you know what, today was the good day. That's what they're going to remember is they got to see all this. And not once did we have to get after them because I don't know about Sarah, I'm sure you were perfect, but kids in public, oh my heavens, they are totally different animals. <laughs> Kid leashes for 10 year olds, I'm okay with. Um, it's just, but we sat there and said, you know what? it was such a good day i feel like they got so much out of that and they were so joyful but we have to give ourselves credit for what we're doing because i'm going on 40 and my drive for learning hasn't stopped just because i finished college and i did a high school stuff i don't remember any of that um i just we just need to stop being so hard on ourselves <laughs> Yeah, you're, yeah. Um, I'm sure she's talked about this before, but um, it is those those little things that they do remember. You know, it's not the, the intentional molding of your children's minds that'll be the thing that lingers, you know, that, that builds their fond memories of their growing up homeschool years with mom, um, cause it's not mine. Um, I remember very few, in fact, I remember very few of the experiences sitting and reading a school book or problem solving, you know, something in math with mom. The things I do remember were the times when I, you know, was just stressed out of my mind over fractions and, and was, you know, having an emotional breakdown at the dinner table, you know, after dinner, still finishing schoolwork. And, and that's, you know, so that's, <laughs> The few school memories I have, intentional school memories, aren't necessarily um, the highlights, but there's there's so few, you know, and it's and it's not a it's not a criticism of parents and schooling. It's just the the books are boring and the school can be hard and it can be overwhelming and those overwhelming moments stuck. But the things that that I feel like are kind of those core memories were the fun things, were the freer activities, the museum trips, um, the tours of places around town, the park days, the so um, you know, and I was thinking as you were talking that it's not well the feelings that that we all feel on those kinds of adventure days those fun days and in those moments um it's not so much the things we're doing as it is the way that we're feeling when doing the things and the time we're spending together um because since we had a generous amount of that growing up that was just kind of is now how i view normal um according to my childhood memories you know, being a child was great because I felt 
um, curious. I felt loved. I felt like things were possible. I felt kind of free. I felt stimulated. I felt, you know, all these positive feelings, um, creative and unlimited and all these things that these experience, these feelings that these experiences helped to create in me, helped to, you know, provide opportunities to feel that way. Um, so moving forward, I'm actively in pursuit of those feelings. So the things that I'm choosing to do in my life, you know, potential further education or jobs, activities, just conversations with a friend or with family member, I'm seeking, feeling creative, feeling loved, feeling secure, feeling um, free, unlimited, you know, all those things, those positive things that I felt as a child, um, which seems to go right along with what I've heard from my mom about the well-educated heart kind of stuff, where it's, you know, it's so much more about, about your heart than it is the information that's sitting in your brain. Um, so, yeah, so it's the feelings that, that, that the children are feeling when they're younger that will kind of determine what their baseline kind of emotion is or what their normal is and what their goal is as they move forward, you know? Okay, so this is interesting to me as I'm listening to you talk. So I, I was thinking about how that's kind of like if your baseline is your children have grown up feeling the spirit, you know? and knowing what that feels like to feel the spirit in your home. And when they're away from home or where they're in certain situations, if they don't feel that, they, they realize they're missing something and they want to get back to it, you know, and they want to make sure their life is such that they can always feel that familiar feeling. So it can be a similar thing with learning. Mm -hmm. And what you want to fill your life with is this. So, so for the moms, it's creating opportunities for their kids to have these feelings having mm -hmm. the home and their time together be opportunities to have right. those feelings right oh huh. yeah yeah that's really interesting hey Lori like we them. have a couple of new ladies on the call if you want to give them a cliff note <laughs> oh nice okay um I'm just looking to see sorry Rachel, I have to away. oh okay and great yeah Lindsay both Lindsay both Lindsay Cardall and Laura are Bakersfield girls. So that's fun to have them both on here. And Rachel is on. Welcome, Rachel. And congratulations on your, um, your sleep night for your child. I thought that was great. That's got to make her feel so much better. And Cassie is just about 10 or 15 minutes away from where Sarah and I are right now. As Cassie lives over here on the coast. That's fun. Welcome, mamas. Um, we're here talking with Sarah a little bit. Oh, are you kidding? That's so funny. Cassie's in Bakersfield today, where we're from. That's super funny. Oh, well, you missed two, two beautiful days, unless you were over here yesterday and the day before. It was absolutely gorgeous. Um, okay, so we're talking to Sarah, but I think that's a really interesting thing. So you're trying to create these feelings so so it's this it really truly is then that if you're creating this warm heart environment this warm learning environment in your home that's really probably all you have to do I mean I don't even think you need to focus on I mean everybody's different but I don't think you need to focus so much on creating a learning environment I think just a warm environment right Wow. You know, when a, it's, it's kind of, it's that basic needs thing. It's all right. If the child is fed, if they're dressed, if they have a roof over their head and they feel secure and protected and safe, you know, you're working your way up and going, all right, that needs met. This need is met. This need is met because you can't get on to the abstract thought, to the new information, to a higher way of living. If there's want in some basic category, right? So you're stair stepping up and, and before you can get to you know, higher learning and things like that. You have to have that. You have to have security. You have to have love and security. Um, and for it to be something that you pursue on your own, you have to have those met. So yeah. Sarah has her, got her degree in child development. And so a lot of the things when she's speaking about things, it's coming from her own experience, but also from things that she's learned. And so that's helpful talking to her about children mm -hmm. and about how they learn 
and what they need. So I always think that's interesting too. Yeah, so. So love and, con and security could be considered our floor goals. Yeah, 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 I think that's true. There was, oh, I don't know if we talked about this before. Um, there was a conversation I was having with my dad one day when we were talking about um, counsel in the scriptures to become like a little child. I talked about this before. I don't think okay. so. Maybe the first time. Um, becoming like a little child and um, you know, what characteristics of a child are we, are we emulating? What's the, what is it that a child has or does that we don't? And so we were kind of talking about that and they're going, oh, wow. Yeah. It is so much better to be like a child than it is to be like a, you know, semi-successful adult. I mean, trying to be an adult. Um, and then as we were talking, we were kind of realizing, well, I guess if, the goal is for all of us to be, become like children, to be like children, then maybe we should treat each other as such. And what would that look like? What would that look like in a classroom if a teacher, in a college classroom, if a teacher approached it more like, you know, okay, we're all children. Now, not let the content level would, would step down, but how would we treat um, failing a test or struggling on an assignment? or um, presentations or things like that? Would it look any different? And if so, how? Um, or what would that look like in our friendships? What would it look like in our callings at church, um, our church service? What would it look like in our families, um, ch siblings to each other, parent to child, child to parent, if we were all giving each other the, um, the attention that we kind of need as children. The nurturing kind of. Yeah, yeah. Where it's, okay, yep, we messed up. But how can we, what can we learn about this and how can we move forward? Um, and, and, then, and then the last thing we talked about was how can we treat ourselves then if we are, if the goal is to be more like a child? What would our internal dialogue be like? Um, if we saw ourselves as childlike rather than, you know, mm. okay, you're an adult. You should have this figured out by now, dummy. You know, don't, you've done this a million times. Yeah, Why are you doing this again? Right. So no negativity, no shaming. Right. Right. Encouragement. And giving yourself, Hey, you know what? It's a new minute. You can start over right now in this minute. Let's just try a little harder to be better. It's going to be hard, but we're just going to do our best. And, mm -hmm. and, Praising little successes, little victories. Building. Yeah. Complimenting. You know, showing a lot of love and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, and then devoting time to, um, to pursuits that are, you know, that kind of bring your mind alive, get your imagination going, get a little bit dirty, get kind of tired, tuckered out. You know, how would we spend our time if we were, would we play a little bit more? Would we relax a little bit more? Would we, we would probably live more in each moment, you know? Mm -hmm. So anyway, this is this whole long conversation we were, ended up having, but um, so I'm trying to just summarize into points. Um, so anyway, so what would that look like in every facet of our lives? And, and how would we, what would our day-to-day -day life look like? Yeah, that means we get to re have the, uh, to remember that play is learning <laughs> and right. still for all of us. And that goes along with Lindsay Bunting's comment where she says, uh, from Marlene Peterson, it says, I have come to believe the purpose of education is to help children live lives of maximum joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why not? I mean, seriously, not just as a little side comment, but why not? What's so wrong with that? what negative thing would come from that, from that being your pursuit as a mom. I wanna make sure, what I wanna do as a mom is help, help my children live, uh, live lives of maximum joy. Wouldn't that ease up your schedule a little bit? <laughs> it would have mine. Yeah, well, and doesn't it seem like if your life is a life full of joy, then as you are moving on out of your teens into the rest of your life, um, what's your perspective of the world and your relation to it? 
um, and you, your yes, possible you. level of impact on the world. Um, I bet that the children who have experienced a childhood full of joy and feeling that warmth and security will feel a lot less hesitation um, dreaming big, doing hard things, big things, um, being adventurous in their future learning and experiences that they're having in their young adult years um, because they have this strong and uh, very supportive foundation that they're launching from. Um, so the world seems much more possible um, and the impact that they can have on it seems like a very real possibility. Um, and, uh, and then they don't have to become, you know, the next astronauts, but they could, if they want to, it's a possibility, you know, they don't have to have a, a massive title or, you know, any worldly recognition, but they will be a person who's full of joy that's going out into the world. And, you know, and every person that they come in contact with and everything that they do will be a little blessing to, to that moment, those people in that moment and the people that just come in contact with them. And that's Can you a big thing. A world like that today for kids are like that. Wouldn't that be yeah. beautiful? <laughs> but I think that's what the, the hope for the future is, you know, is uh, us as moms, you know, and these young adults that are going to be moms providing this different kind of an environment for our children and and making a change, making that difference, you know, in by small and simple things, you know, again. You know, it's, I see a lot of hope in that. But I'm wondering, how do you get a teenager off the couch? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I mean, if they're not doing it, you know, if they're, yeah. How do you do that? How do you motivate them from there or, or a preteen? You know, how do you motivate them from there right. to where these moms want them to be? Because they don't want to fail them. And so they want to do this warm heart learning. But they also know there are transcripts or or not, because I think not, because I didn't do it with, I only did it with Stevie, not with the other three of you, or did I do it with you? I don't know. Anyway, um, but but they don't want to fail them. So then they start panicking and throw in the classes and the curriculum because they don't want them to fail right. in college or at life. So how do you how do you motivate a child who like hasn't grasped? that yet so I have a tangent yeah. a little bit um yeah. maybe before you get some motivation I wonder if this will lead you there like I keep thinking of the idea of healthy attachments and and the fact that like um, every kid will need a different um will go through stages of needing more foundational support maybe <clears throat> than that say their siblings um, I don't know. I guess I'd like to speak to that really quick. Like, what do you think about creating a, a, in terms of what you're saying, can you like turn it slightly with these other, not trying to be buzzwords, but how would you put what you're saying under the heading of healthy attachments? Um, I mean, well, I don't, I don't think you can be too warm. Um, I don't think you can show too much love unless it became cutting too much slack where there needs to be some structure and some rules that are followed, but. Right, um, and any mom would too, right? Would say that structure and rules is love, a form of love. Yeah. A loving yeah. Um, support if that's what that child needs at that time, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, I guess what it looks like parent to child varies so much with each child because we're all so different. Um, so some will need more structure. Some will need more words of affirmation and cuddle time and some, you know, it'll just, it varies so much. So I guess the method, the method will change depending on whatever, you know, mom and dad, as they're praying about what their kids need, whatever you feel like is the right method for that child and eat from moment to moment too, because it can change that much too. Um, but I think as long as your method and that child, as long as you're getting to a goal of um, 
my child knows that I love them, that everything I do is for their happiness, you know, for their safety and happiness in life. Um, but I guess how you get there isn't, it doesn't matter so much, you know, it's because there's so many variables, it has to be decided moment by moment by the parents. But yeah, I don't. Well, and so what you said just now, like, um, I guess I want to like support, you know, I support other moms and I'm trying myself to be present when a child will go through these developmental needs that um, bring a new, a renewed need for um, strengthening that foundation at a de different developmental stage, right? Like you kind of go through those, those times mm -hmm. where you need to reconnect again you know, not, not again, right, but strongly create those bounds, boundaries, or connections, but I'm sorry, I also want to, like, you can cut all of that out, <laughs> just, I'm making no sense, but the, but when you say everything I'm doing is to create this loving environment, I, I need other moms to know that loving themselves is part of that, that I don't do everything I do to feed my children, right? Like not everything I do is to feed my children, but loving myself is part of um, creating an understanding that when they grow up, they should have space for themselves as well as a parent. Um, so some people would call that boundaries, <laughs> but I'm just gonna throw that out there. How do you motivate a kid though? Um, Anyway, there you go. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that um, a very important thing to remember is what you, what you just said, Barbara. And that's what we've been talking about for a few weeks now is moms have to replenish. You have to restore. You have to fill your cup. You have to be nurturing yourself first. It's that, you know, putting on the oxygen mask. You have yeah, to do that a little bit. That, that or is, you won't even see your child's needs. Like right, their needs yeah. will change and you won't be aware of it. Exactly. No, They're that has to be your foundation. You love and you won't hear it, you know? Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Or you're just run yourself so ragged that you you don't have what you need to be able to to yeah. take care of them, to nurture them, to support them. You've got yeah. to take care of that foundational thing first because you've also got to be in a place from the way we see it, that you can receive the spirit, you know, and you can get those promptings because without them, you will not know those specific things that you do to, to reach each child. Well, you know? And listening yeah. to you guys, it also makes me think, you know, most of what we learn as kids is modeled by our authority figures in our lives. And so if we're talking about, if we go back to, you know, hierarchy of needs, if mom always feeds us and makes sure we feel secure, but mom's not physically taking care of herself and mom doesn't feel secure. It doesn't matter, you know, no. how much on that list mom does for us. We will yeah. feel unsettled because mom's unsettled, you know? Yeah. So it starts with mom. It's modeled by mom and dad that, that meeting those needs, you know, stepping up the ladder um, because you can do all the tricks and everything like that with us, but it, but we know when something's off we know when they're struggling we know yeah. and it, it's unsettling yeah um, you know your parents aren't in a good place when they're when they're not doing well when they're undernourished you know whether yeah. it's mentally emotionally spiritually or physically so I was yeah my, my the back first, of this. Oh, go ahead Barbara oh the back of this um book like adult children of or adult children of oh gosh immature parents right as adult children right you guys are gonna have to edit out everything I say I swear. <laughs> <laughs> um anyway there are five types of immature parents right just a quick let's divide the world into five things right and um and if and uh, as an adult we are still immature in those areas like you're just not gonna know what you're not seeing you're just not gonna no, it's not there, you know, that the kids are asking for a more mature foundation out of you. 
anyway, there you go. Yeah. Well, and that's the blessing of, um, of the having the spirit, you know, you might not have all the skills and you might not have the foundation yourself, but if you are doing the daily nurturing of yourself and you're listening to the spirit, then you'll be able to get all of that, you know, and the, your, your, Oh, your faults, your weaknesses, whatever, those things that you came into parenting with won't hold you back because the spirit will make up for that and give you what you need. Don't you think? Well, and that's a desire to grow yourself, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what your kids need to see. And I think it's when we're, when we fail them, not when we don't give them the right curriculum or whatever, we fail them when we haven't nurtured ourselves and got ourselves into a healthy place. Because when I first dove into menopause, or premenopause or whatever. Uh, I mean, I fell hard and that is, is a time period that Sarah knows well, and she felt very insecure in her environment. And we talked about it later because I wasn't there, you know, and I wasn't taking care of myself. I was still trying to do all the things I thought I had to do, but I wasn't, I wasn't putting on that oxygen mask first and they, they felt it. So you know, you can't leave yourself out of the equation, but you just, you do need to be guided by the spirit so that you're, you do what you need to do, what it is that fills you up and provides that foundation for you, for your kids. We have a few comments going on. Adrian said, what if heart warm heart? Oh, excuse me. What if warm heart learning is impossible? And Rachel added on said, that's exactly where I'm at. The struggle between heartwarming and making sure that they have what they need to be successful. Yeah. Sarah talking. could maybe maybe because some of you moms weren't here when Sarah talked before she could maybe address what it what she felt it took for her to be successful in college and in life you know what you took from your school or growing up that actually benefited you in your college and and after yeah. life after life <laughs> And the other comments, it says, um, Lindsay Bunting said, all they need to be successful is to be able to find joy, filling the spirit themselves. And then Peggy added, remember the show Clean Sweep? I do. I love that show. On TLC, Peter Walsh was so down to earth on how to overcome cluttering and holding on to unimportant things. He said that children need six things, food, shelter, clothing, love, responsibilities, and routine. Mm -hmm. Let me add on to that. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the teen years are hard because there's a lot of pressure that is felt by, I'm sure parents, and I felt it myself as well. Um, and uh, definitely felt underqualified and underprepared um, and it did not take myself seriously because I was like, I'm a homeschooled kid. I can't do this college thing. I don't know that I know enough and I'll be at a different level than everybody else. And I'm not used to this classroom lecture, you know, whiteboard instruction environment. Um, and so it was, it was very stressful getting prepared to apply for um, college and um, ACT prep and testing and then going. So it was, it was a very tense, stressful, overwhelming few years um, that now I know I wasted so much emotional energy worrying about it because everything worked out perfectly. Um, and, and I know that this is just me speaking from my experience, but um, I, I was very prepared um, and I didn't realize it and I didn't give myself credit for it because I didn't think that our more loose structure, especially, um, especially in those last few years, I didn't think that was gonna transition well and it totally did. Um, I loved college. I, my first semester, there were some things to get used to, but it didn't take very long. It took a couple of weeks and I felt like I was 
kind of just meant to be there. I belonged um, by my first presentation in one of my classes. Um, I felt like, all right, I can do this. I belong here. I'm just like everybody else here, if not a little bit more prepared because I'm coming in with confidence I didn't know I had in my knowledge and my education experience. Um, which is, and, and none of that confidence or preparation uh, came necessarily from academic knowledge stored in my brain. It was so much more just the person that my parents had taught me to be and the confidence that I felt in myself spiritually, you know, who I am to my heavenly father um, and what my purpose is in life, you know, then everything else just seemed like, all right, these are awesome things I get to do in this process of life and becoming more like Jesus Christ. You know, so how can I turn this assignment into something that will benefit me long-term? And it's maybe not so much, okay, I need to sit down and memorize all this, or maybe I do need to sit down and memorize all this, but I know it's just so I can do well on the test so I can say that I did my best. Um, and if I can recognize things for what they are. It, so, so my confidence I felt in college was the ability to differentiate between temporal and eternal things um, and saying, all right, this is important. And it's important now because I want to do well, but it's not, it's not going to carry, I'm not going to carry the weight of this C on a test for the rest of my life. Um, it was hard. This class was hard. I did not understand the teacher where I was underprepared for this test. And I got a C, darn it. You know, I don't like what that did to my GPA, but my GPA doesn't last forever and it's not the most important thing. So it's kind of having this perspective of, okay, I value myself enough to work hard, um, but I have the, the confidence in spiritual things to have perspective and not, and knowing that that perspective does not equate to laziness either, which I know some of my roommates kind of felt sometimes. Um, that struggle so, of, yeah, go ahead. When you say I value myself enough to work hard, I think that that points all things to this. How can you get a lazy teen off the couch? Mm. Can you, you know, strengthen that foundation enough yeah. that that child values himself enough? Yeah. And, I don't know. Yeah, and it's so, you know, it's so much, uh, it's kind of amazing how much of, of our success in productivity kinds of things, life things is not a matter of tricks or routines necessarily, not that they don't have a place, but it's so much more a matter of, of your internal, emotional, spiritual well-being. And if we're in a good place there, then the kind of temporal things you feel like okay you know now i can i feel some motivation to take some charge here um i don't know if that i don't know if that makes sense but um i know that when i am in a place where i'm out of the habit of daily prayer or scripture reading you know when when i don't when i'm not in a place where i'm as focused and have that perspective that I'm supposed to have a lot of things in my life start falling through cracks. Um, I'm super unmotivated. Um, I've lost kind of vision for where I'm going. And so I get very discouraged. I'm hypercritical of myself. I get stressed out very easily and I get nothing done and I'm not improving. I'm not growing. Um, and it, that has happened over and over through my life. It happened a ton in my teens. <laughs> um, I was very reluctant to participate in family responsibilities. I, um, lacked a vision for my, for my future and just phases. Um, and, uh, but when I was at a point where I was like, okay, I have to take back some control here. I have to be serious about the foundational things of importance to me, which is spiritual. 
So getting back to, okay, praying, reading my scriptures, um, just introducing that little bit of, of structure into my life and um, bringing myself a little more in tune with the spirit, I'd find that, oh, hey, you know what? Doing my chores isn't so bad. I kind of like spending time around my family and I feel like I'm contributing. And you know what? I'm actually, I feel like I do kind of see what my purpose is in life and where I'm going. So I kind of maybe do want to be a little more dedicated to my schoolwork because I want to take back a little more charge and control moving forward and growing up. Um, and I, you know what, I actually am excited about my future because there's a lot of things I can do and a lot of good that I could do. I just have to, I just have to get there. So I've got to work hard now, you know, so I don't know if my, I feel like I'm just kind of all over the place and rambling. So hopefully something kind of made some sense. Um, but I think a lot of that, a lot of, of what we struggle with when it comes to motivation and progress is, is just internal um, well-being. If we're Looks in a like good Kathy place there. On. Kathy, did you have anything to add? You came on. I didn't know if you wanted to talk. <laughs> sure, I'd love to say something about this. I want to second what Sarah is saying. Um, hi, Sarah, again. <laughs> hi. Um, my daughter, my oldest, just went through the temple, um, and she's getting ready to go on her mission, and um, she's also been doing some classes online at BYU-Idaho, and let me tell you, um, college has been difficult for her, but every year in school was difficult for her. <laughs> she was a learner in a different way. Like she had a struggle to put her name on the paper, you know? So it's, it's hard to sit in front of a screen or just do assignments constantly. But, but her testimony, when we went through the temple with her, several of the adults who were there with us who were just friends from the ward were complimenting her as her, her maturity and her 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 confidence and her peace with the gospel and I was thinking you know as a mom I am just so thankful that she came out of my home with a strong foundational testimony and confidence to share the gospel and I hope that education continues throughout her whole life you know that she'll learn and grow and and develop her talents and be able to serve and do what she wants. But I love that the focus that you're talking about is not really on academics, but on character and, and testimony and what is most important. I want to second that until you, you can see that in you, Sarah, you can see how that is just 100% of who you are and kudos to your mom, you know, and, and your dad and, and to you guys as a family together to do that. But so many young moms really struggle was focusing on the academics and making sure everything's perfect and nothing was ever perfect for my daughter and it was always pulling my hair out trying to figure out how to make sure she learned what she needed to learn but in the end and thank goodness I met Lori who helped me relax and let her be her you know let Audrey be who she wanted to be but um it was it's what what's most important is their testimony and who they are and their their confidence in that but I wanted to just second what you were saying. So that's awesome. Thanks. Yeah, it's kind of what's what's the goal? Where do you want to be? You know, and if are we focusing purely on what job they can get after college, you know, and how much how successful they can be, or the kind of person that they they become, and um, and where they end their life, where their standing is, you know, when they come to the end of their life. Um, which seems maybe a little bit dramatic when you're talking early years of childhood and raising them and homeschooling and or mothering, whatever it is. But um, but that is the whole point. You know, what kind of person are we now in 10 years and at the end of our lives? Um, so how can we facilitate children becoming the best version of themselves, you know, reaching their fullest potential. Um, but I think that even like, even where we're living right now, like the, the children that we're raising, um, you know, so much of um, their careers might be rooted in um, change, 
managing change. And if character isn't there, um, they may not be able to handle that well, right? Like we, mm -hmm. we used to know these statistics that, you know, a person would change their job maybe once every 15 years, once every 10 years, right? Where now it's like once every five, it's careers, change their whole career, you know? Mm -hmm. And never mind like, um, you know, so many businesses now are built on a person's reputation alone. Anyhow, I just want to add that I think um, even statistics and current environment would back up everything you're saying about character. Yeah, you know, and I, I think too, um, I think that not to be sound overly dramatic, but Satan's plan is to sidetrack you as moms, all of us as moms. His, his goal is to get you focused on something that doesn't matter as much and to worry and spend time on that rather than on the simple, easy answers and formulas. And honestly, I can tell you that I know from looking back at my family and my, um, my child rearing years and those homeschool years, that the most important things we did were have family prayer and family scripture study and family home evening and that we went to the temple and that we um, as parents really tried to magnify our callings and to be good wise stewards you know our um our family, our kids had a lot of work and responsibilities that they had to do, but that even was rooted. It had a spiritual foundation because we felt like it was important to be wise stewards over the things that we were blessed with. And so we taught them that. Um, we There's a great article, I've referenced it before. It's a BYU article called Family Work. And it talks a lot about you know really good principles that could help you as you're trying to establish that in your family. But that that spiritual foundation if you work on on setting that if that's what you focus on with your children is is developing creating whatever building that spiritual foundation and then causing them to feel what sarah talked about i don't think you'd have to worry about anything else like marlene mentioned if they're going to be scientists or mathematicians or something that needs that extra schooling, they're going to find that drive because they're gonna have this warm environment for them to feel supported and for them to have confidence in themselves and for that to come into their own hearts. And then you can provide that for them. Um, uh, otherwise, it really is okay to let them go and let them pursue the things that they're naturally interested in. Uh, maybe heart learning doesn't look like you think it should. Maybe our definition and our picture of heart learning is, isn't correct. You know, maybe we're still working on that vision. Maybe playing in the mud, I mean, I really think playing in the mud is heart learning. Um, playing Minecraft could be heart learning. Um, sitting at the piano, just messing around could be heart learning. Jumping on the trampoline, playing dollhouse, making cookies, listening to music riding dirt bikes, laying on the bed, just thinking. All those things can be heart learning. They just don't look like anything educational, you know, that we are familiar with. Well, that, that makes me think of, um, in the last couple of years, I've been trying to think about, okay, because I felt like I was losing my focus or kind of losing um, my enjoyment for life. So I was thinking, okay, how can, cause I, I loved being a kid and I did all kinds of things and whatever sounded fun and without hesitation. And I was missing that, you know, why do I hesitate? Why do I feel like I have to structure my day out? Why do I have to plan to spend time doing something creative? Why can't I just do things because that sounds good, you know? And so, um, so in the last couple of years, I've been trying to pay more attention to what i feel like in a moment, what, right, what I feel drawn to. Um, so, you know, it'll be like, with the exception of work, which is, you know, which is fine. Um, <laughs> when I have time that I can use um, just for myself, 
um, I've been, I've gotten in the habit of just kind of pausing and trying to listen to like what I feel like I want to do. And it's kind of hard at first because like, oh, I don't feel like anything. I don't, I don't know. Um, but I'll just kind of go, mm, I feel like I want to do something small with my fingers. I want to work with my hands. Um, and so I have a paint by numbers that my parents got me for Christmas. And so I'll pull that out and I'll sit down and I'll do the little paint by numbers show or, uh, it's, I'm just good at following instructions. Um, know, but it's so cool. So anyway, or I'll feel like, okay, um, I want to, you know, I feel like I have a lot of things in my head and I kind of want to make more sense of them. So I pick up my journal and I journal. Or, um, you know what? I feel like I just need to do something a little bit bigger and I feel like I need to be free for a minute. And so I go on a walk. Um, so you talking about heart learning just kind of made me think about that, yeah. that, that paying attention to, okay, or teaching them, you know, how to pay attention to, what do you feel like doing right now? What do you, what do you kind of just feel settled about right now? Where do you feel excited about? Do you feel just even a little twinge of something? That's what you should go spend your time doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why a teenager is sitting on the couch or scrolling on their phone because they don't, they're not sure what they want to do. They don't know if they have permission to do what they want to do. I mean, not necessarily. Or it's you, embarrassing but, to do right. what you want. Or they to don't do have the confidence. Like right. Right. A lot of it is that like, oh, that wouldn't be cool for like my my peers or something or my siblings might make fun of me or or maybe I'm just not confident enough yet well the other thing self. is if you if you are out of touch with that yeah, if you yeah. don't know how to read yourself inside and kind of know where you're at and where you feel drawn to you're just kind of in this kind of stupor feel a little lost and you're drifting and so you and that's a scary feeling so you turn to your phone you turn to tv you turn to is something that occupies your mind so you don't have to dwell on the fact that that you're feeling undecided unsettled because that's a little bit scary especially I remember feeling that way as a teenager um especially because not too long before you were a kid and you knew what you wanted to do or at least I did I knew what I wanted to do and I'd go do it and um or I knew what I wanted to do but I had rules and structure and so I'd do that there was but there was always something and then you hit your teens and yeah, it was just pretty lost. It was a little too, it was confusing, kind of foggy. Well, and you had a lot of people, a lot of other people telling you. Oh yeah. And then everybody telling you what you should be doing. This is what's cool. This is what cool people do for fun. This is what our friend group thinks is funny. This is what we do for fun. Um, we, we make fun of this or whatever, you know, or think about your future. You're going to be an adult soon. Start getting ready for college which is good, but not if it's kind of debilitating and not if it is crowding out your internal drive for things. That's those little things that just kind of call out to you. And I don't know if that makes me sound super weird, um, <laughs> but that's how it, that's, I just remember feeling that way. And so I know I'm trying to bring myself back to the way I felt when I was younger just very in touch with with my heart my mind you know like they were connected and they could get on the same page and not be critical of each other if that makes sense mind not being critical of the heart heart not being critical or feeling hurt by my mind my reasoning like well we can't do that because that just doesn't make sense um so i'm i'm yeah so i'm working on connecting the two and getting in touch with with what sparks joy, what things I feel kind of drawn to do um, by just pausing and trying to listen. Um, and, and then I, people in my family can tell you, I'll be like, um, I think, okay, I'm not sure, but I'm thinking maybe play piano. And so I'll sit down at the piano and I won't even finish the song because I'll be like, nope, that's not it. Mm -hmm. And, but then by doing that, I'll go, oh, no, nope, what I want to do is this. And I'll go, you know, end up reading or something like that. Um, Does it help to have a parent do things like that? Mm, a parent it didn't help me. Oh, modeling? Mm -hmm. 
yeah, probably. Right, that it's okay to, to not know what you want to do with your time, but to try anything out. That not telling you, just mom. Yeah, yeah. I think that would come across as joy, just mother mm-hmm. having joy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I told Lori this before, but like one time I spent two whole weeks where I just decided you know, I see myself building up resentment in my life for no good reason. I don't think, but I'm just going to check. So for two whole weeks, if I don't want to do it, I'm not going to do it. (laughs) And it was lovely. I recommend every mom doing that because we do get caught up in ourselves and it comes back to you talking about like, what if we all had youthful childish joy, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. There were times I wanted to do the dishes, but I at least checked, do I want to do the dishes? Yeah. (laughs) And, um, gosh, it, I just, that resentment that was building up in all my adult work was just gone. Mm -hmm. I, I, they couldn't exist in the same place either. I wanted to do what I'm doing. Yeah. And this is what it looks like, or I don't and change it. Yeah. I reserve the right to change my mind. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, that makes it okay. So I was telling, I was telling my mom about this a couple of days ago. There's, there's a dietitian on Instagram that I was following. And normally I think oh, dietitian, whatever. Um, but, but she was intriguing because her whole thing is, um, there is no diet. There is no way that you have to do things. What you need to do is be in touch with your body and what your body is wanting and needing. Um, And what we need to do is kind of detox our mind, stomach, you know, connection, kind of clean things up. Um, Yeah, intuitive eating. Um, Instead of saying, well, I don't eat carbs anymore. um, I can eat carbs, you know, and and by, by not giving ourselves too many rules, we kind of, we've, okay, I'm thinking too far ahead. Hold on. Um, she says, you should be able to eat whatever you want and you just moderate it. And if you are responding to your body and what it's wanting and needing, you will find that your cravings for things that aren't good for you go down because your body knows, you know what? She takes care of me. She consistently takes care of me and I have fun. You know, we have fun foods. Um, I'm not missing out on anything. I don't feel restricted. Um, just, and so I, so you know what, when I'm at a barbecue, I'll have a hamburger and some chips and a soda because that sounds really good right now. But if it doesn't sound really good, just go eat off the fruit plate. You know, don't ever eat anything out of pressure or expectation to eat it. And you'll find that kind of like what you were saying um, was you will kind of find yourself wanting to do the dishes. You'll find yourself wanting to eat the good stuff, wanting to eat less of the bad stuff because you know, you trust yourself that you're taking care of yourself and that you're having fun too. Um, so that you're, you know, all your needs are met. Um, you're not starving yourself. You are not missing out on those foods that make you happy. Cause there are some things that once it hits your tongue, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, and you feel happy. Um, you can, anyway, we're not talking about diet, but I'm relating that to what you were saying that yeah, you, I think there is value in letting yourself have fun, pursuing the fun things. And then you're, you know, you're one, one, what you want to do starts changing and starts to incorporate those productive things to those good things. Um, but two, you're happy because you, you can trust yourself with yourself. You well, and like in dieting, care. right? Yeah. Like I spent so much less time stewing about maybe doing the dishes and you know what I mean? I just, I felt, yeah, I had a lot more time to do things I actually enjoyed, you know, and, right. and, uh, anyway, it is nice. I, it is nice. Like yeah. making sure you listen to yourself and yes. follow through is a beautiful thing. And which makes me, I mean, none of us are f- we're stay at home moms. If, if we're a stay at home mom, if we're not working outside the home. I mean, there's so much gratitude that I can have for those who have created this environment for me and for my kids, this time for me and for my kids. And, um, that translates to a joy too. Um, 
Anyhow. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. I think I have to mm -hmm. sign off, but I love you guys. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Barbara. You. Now, I'm curious to know if Linnell, if you have a question or comment or, or anything before we wrap up, because Linnell's good about providing our kind of summaries and things like that. <laughs> I do have a thought. Thank you. I've been thinking about something my parents shared with me this past week, all week long. So I'll share it with you guys. They are getting some renovations done in their home. So they're staying in like a vacation rental in the meantime. And it's right across the beach. They're in Hawaii. So they're in, they're in this rental home and right across the street, they could see the beach and there was this really big shoulder. And so they saw this pickup truck pull up and behind the pickup truck, there was a trailer and in it, there were two animals, a horse and a mule. So my parents are retired. They don't have much on their plate. And so they sat there and watched and laughed and were really tempted to record what they were seeing, but they wanted to be respectful, so they didn't. So they told us this story that one man got out and pulled out the horse and took him over the rocks and got onto the sand in the beach and went for a ride on the beach but the mule would not budge. He didn't want to come out. And my parents stood there watching as the owner tried to yank him out, tried to push him out, tried to get a rope, tried to go from behind and push him. And so they're on the shoulder of the road, but the mule didn't want to go onto the sand near the beach for whatever reason. And so he started going into the oncoming traffic the other way. So it's kind of a dangerous situation. And eventually, I don't know how long it took, but he kept trying to yank him onto the beach and it was really hard. Finally, it wasn't until this mule saw the other horse and its rider that it started to move forward and it was still reluctant but at least it got a little farther than when the owner was trying to push him out and so i think there are a lot of parallels and i think this relates really well to what we've been discussing that it's really hard to push your kids it's really hard to push a mule when they are set to not do anything they won't and I just realized now as I'm telling you the story that it could be really dangerous if we try to push them because they walk, they go into the oncoming traffic. And so if we try so hard to push and to shove and to pull and to yank and to force, they can do things that can get themselves into a lot of danger and a lot of trouble. And so I think about what is that horse and how can we be like the horse and what could be owner have done to inspire and invite and entice so that it, and they wouldn't have such a difficult experience together. together. And so, so much of what I'm learning in homeschooling and being a mother and a parent and even as a wife is what kind of person can I be and what can I do to be a light, to shine, to inspire, to invite and it's a daily, um, daily. I wouldn't say struggle, but it's. It definitely takes skill and practice to learn this, and so I'm grateful for opportunities to ponder and to think about what am I doing and how am I doing and how can I improve so that I can invite my children and be a model for them. That's good. I like that. <laughs> that. Then the word enticing, because it makes you think of in scriptures where we talk about in the, the spirit inviteth and enticeth, which sometimes maybe seems in parenting weak to be inviting and enticing, but it's not. If that's the way that we're learning truth and good things through the spirit, then why wouldn't we use that same practice um, in parenting? Inviting and enticing good things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. And Linnell, you've done it again. Thank you for providing <laughs> the perfect summary for our discussion time. Moms, it's been so wonderful. And I'm sorry we don't have more time, but we want to take advantage of this time that we have together, just the two of us. 
um, and which has been absolutely wonderful over here. So we're gonna go back to that, but thanks for letting us share with you for a while and thanks for your wonderful comments and questions and things. And we will get back to it again next Friday. So thank you for being here.